Martin Luther, you'll see it in a moment, he once famously tweeted, uh, there are three conversions necessary. The conversion of mind, and purse. To put it another way, in a way that I've heard, uh, we just did a baptism. The last thing to get baptized is your wallet. That's another way I've heard this. Can we show there's Martin Luther? Yeah, he's still very active on Twitter. We've been covering over these three weeks uh, this series of great love, talking about God's great love, but really it had to do a lot with reflecting that love out, not simply recognizing it, although we have to do that in order to reflect it. And we talked about loving, loving like God the first week, and then last week we talked about listening to God, and flowing out of that then, giving out of abundance is our topic this week. And I think giving shapes the giver. I think giving says a lot about us as well, about the giver itself or yourself. And we need to give out of abundance because God is not a God of scarcity. You know, the, the, the verse that we kind of had in the back of our mind from 1 John 4, 11 and 12 really talked about loving one another. And that's how we show that we understand God's love for us is that we're reflecting that with one another. When God lavishes that love on us, when we give that to one another, we don't have less love. And that's how God works. God is a God of abundance. He is lavishing on us. Things in, 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 in many cases that we don't even deserve. Grace. Love. And today we're talking about giving. We will use tithing, actually, because we're going to talk about Deuteronomy 14, but we'll qualify some of that by the end. And I I really, I ask you to follow from Deuteronomy 14. Um, You can follow in your Bible if you're mobily inclined. Go for it on your mobile device. But God gives abundantly. God loves us. And as we look at this, I want us to see the, the grace that's involved in what God instructs in Deuteronomy regarding giving and the tithe particularly. As you're finding Deuteronomy 14, let me just give you a a little historical sort of intro to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is is actually a a very significant book in the Old Testament. Um, I think sometimes we tend to ignore it because it's the second telling of the law. And we think, if you're reading the Bible, well, I already read this, and it's the law. That doesn't often inspire us in our culture, I think. But what you have here is a reminder God had given the law, which incidentally is life, as far as people were concerned in the Old Testament. That was God's grace. That was love from God being bestowed on people. If you want to walk with me, God says, here's how. And we call it law, and people saw it that way. This is how we walk with God. We hear law, and we don't think the same way often about law. But Deuteronomy is a reminder of the law. It's the second telling of the law. It's happening right before the people enter the promised land. So they're being reminded, this is how you're supposed to act when you enter the land. And then besides that, um, it's also they're about to lose Moses, their leader who's led them this whole way. And this is not simply how you're supposed to act when you enter the land, but now that you're going to lose your leader, remember these things. How you're supposed to be, how you're supposed to function. Before I read Deuteronomy 14, I just want to uh, give a little focusing thought that I'll return to in a little bit. And it comes from a 1980s public service announcement commercial, I believe it was. Um, You know, you remember uh, in the 80s, they had a lot of um, sort of the say no to drugs campaigns, some very uh, persuasive, you know, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs, those sorts of things. Um, But then there was one that that, um, I was asking some people if they remember it and they don't, so apparently I'm just the one who remembers it, but these two kids walk into a parking garage, and they snap off an antenna of a car. Ha, 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 this is funny, and go walking off. And for whatever reason, that maybe it's just because I saw it when I was a kid, and I didn't connect the dots, but the kid ends up in that same car later with what appears to be his dad, who turns on the radio, and it's only fuzz, because there's no antenna on the car. Oh, man, Those kids, somebody knocked off our antenna, and the kid who was involved is sitting there in the car thinking, oh, now I can't enjoy the radio either. What have I done? Keep that in mind. I'll return to it in just a moment. But let's read Deuteronomy 14, 26. 
It says this, be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine, and olive oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God, at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name, so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. But if that place is too distant and you have been blessed by the Lord your God and cannot carry your tithe, because the place where the Lord will choose to put his name is so far away, then exchange your tithe for silver and take the silver with you and go to the place the Lord your God will choose. Use the silver to buy whatever you like, cattle, sheep, wine, or other fermented drink, or anything you wish. Then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice. When we think about tithing. I don't know that we often think about eating it, do we? We think about giving it, and it's given away. It's interesting that in the instructions here in Deuteronomy, they're told, come to my presence, bring the food with you, and eat it in my presence. They're not going to eat the entire tithe, because there's other parts that it goes towards. But look at that. That's very interesting. I think sometimes we think uh, in the ancient world, if somebody were sacrificing to a god, let's say, that they're setting this in front of a shrine and things just rot. They've wasted this food. But quite often in the ancient world, people would come and they would eat together. And, and that's what you read here. That's what God's asking for. And God doesn't need it, is what's very interesting. God's not the one eating the food. God wants it, though. He says, bring it, bring 10%, bring it to my presence and eat it there. And, and many scholars that I was, I, was, I was looking into this this week point out that bringing the 10% consecrates the 90%. That's what they're doing in this. And, and, and giving, like I said, it reveals a lot about the person doing the giving. It reveals much about our relationship. If they're giving 10% of what they have grown, do they trust God with that other 90%? Is that going to sustain them or not? Do we trust that God's going to provide throughout the rest of the year as we give first? You can even read that there of this, what we've grown. Do we really believe that all that we have belongs to God or not? Because that's part of the claim. God owns everything. And, and sometimes when it comes to giving, we can be a little bit entitled, I think, or have sort of that mentality. These people could have had it too. Okay, I worked the soil, I tilled the ground, I put the plants in, the seeds, I took all the weeds out, I harvested it, and now, God, you want 10% of that? I did the work. And we can think the exact same way today, can't we? I did the work. I went in day in and day out, not at my desk. I worked outside. I did whatever I did day in and day out. Now, God, you want me to give some of my hard-earned whatever, money probably for us, away? But here's the thing. Part of giving is honoring God. That's what he's saying. You're supposed to honor me with this because here's the real truth. Okay, you worked the ground. Who gave the ground the ability to produce in the first place? Who created the seed that could grow in the first place? Who gave you life at all? We're honoring God by giving. That's what we discover in Deuteronomy. There's an anecdote that's floated around for years, um, and it's about a scientist years in the future. I like scientists, so I'm not anti-scientist, but this one's a funny story. The scientist, anyways, years in the future, they figured out cloning, but we figured out cloning and then some, because the scientist goes to God and says, we figured out not just how to clone, but we can do it from dirt now, just like you created from dirt, God. So as it turns out, we don't need you anymore. We can do it all. And so God says, well, that's really fascinating. Let's have a contest. Why don't we both collect dirt and see who can create a human faster? And so the scientist says, great, let me just collect a sample and I'll go back to my lab. He reaches down, scoops some dirt, and God says, wait a minute, get your own dirt. <laughs> in giving, we're honoring God by recognizing where it came from in the first place. God gave us the ability to work 
in this case, gave them even the ability to work the land. That's a grace. That's a gift undeserved. We also read, if you go to verse 26, just the, there's two sentences in that verse. Go to the second sentence. It says, Then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice. A tithe is a very personal thing. You should do it with your household. You should do it together. And, and uh, if you go even further back, right, there's a lot of grace involved because the first part of 26, after they've been instructed, look, if the place I choose for you to eat the tithe is too far away, exchange everything for silver, and then come to verse 26. Use the silver to buy whatever you like. Use it to buy whatever you like. All of those things. And then, and then eat it with your household. Sometimes I don't think we recognize the grace that God grants to us in so many ways. There was an article this week I read on CNN that was titled Millennials Leaving the Church in Droves, Study Finds. Now, it's not news, although it's a new study that suggested it's happening way faster than we thought. And of course, as the church, we need to respond way faster than we think, I think, at this point. But one of the, the um, comments in there, because of course they have to get extreme comments from both sides, was from the communications person for the Center for Inquiry, which is a secular advocacy group. And this person said, it is really good news to see a whole generation of people who are making their own decisions about belief, religion, and spirituality. Now, I know the assumption that he's making behind that, but I don't agree with him that all of a sudden people are now making their own decisions as if they weren't before. But, but here's the thing. I think we sometimes mistake the grace of God for something else, which I think stands behind comments like this. Sometimes we mistake God's grace for a nuisance. Sometimes we mistake God's grace as a restriction on freedom. And so when giving or giving or whatever is mentioned, sometimes people hear that, oh, God just wants more of my money, or the church, worse, wants more of my money. Well, that's not at all what we're reading here. Look at the amount of grace that's involved here, and freedom, in fact, involved here. And, and you see that throughout the whole biblical picture, right? I've talked to people who uh, look at the, the Garden of Eden story, and they say, man, God is so mean, or mean-spirited, because he kicked Adam and Eve out for breaking one rule. They just broke one rule. Isn't God a God of grace and mercy? Well, first of all, it was the only rule. Let's start there. And it was a pretty big thing to transgress. But, but the thing about it is, there's a ton of grace in God kicking Adam and Eve out of the garden. It actually is an act of grace. And here's why. There are two trees. The, the knowledge of the tree of, or tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is what they ate from. But there's the tree of life. And God says, let's not let them eat from that or they're going to make it permanent. The breach in our relationship between us and humans will be permanent. Get them out of here so we can fix the relationship. That's an act of grace. And that's what the rest of the biblical story is. is God trying to fix the relationship. And it was our fault, not his. You see also throughout, and we covered this last week, we talked about Exodus 32, after the people have been released from bondage in Egypt, they're out in the desert, they end up worshiping idols, and God says, I'm through with these people. And Moses says, just have some mercy on them, have some compassion. And God says, I will. I will. There are all kinds of examples through Scripture where God's grace is illustrated when it wasn't deserved, which is sort of the deal with grace, and we sometimes see it wrongly. We see it as the opposite. We see it as restricting or a nuisance. God owns it all, is what you can read throughout Scripture. And he says, hey, give me 10%. Eat it in my presence. Eat it with your family. Choose the good stuff and eat it together. Do that. A tithe is not just personal, it's communal, we discover. We commune with God. We commune with family. We commune with friends with those who don't have. We'll read that in just a moment. And Pastor J. Orr, a pastor of the last century, says the enjoyment of what we have is enhanced 
by sharing it with others. And I think he's absolutely right. And that's absolutely what God's giving us. He says, enjoy it with me. Enjoy it with those you love. Be together in giving to me. It should be an enjoyment, not something you dread. And importantly then, because of this, this gets back to the antenna story, I think. The people are supposed to enjoy this as they give. And sometimes we can destroy our own fun with the wrong attitude, destroy the enjoyment of something by, by uh, seeing it wrongly. But we're supposed to give to God something worth giving. That's a very important point I think we see here. Give the best, give something you might enjoy in this case. They're going to eat it, it says. I've had, uh, enjoyed the hospitality of many people in my years of ministry now. Some, you know, a lot of people are, are on the general bell curve of hospitality, okay to good. And then there are some of those people, I don't know if it's but they excel. They're in another category altogether. The rest of us are graded on a curve comparatively. They're just out there. And, and these are the kind of people who, when they say, come over for coffee, what that means is I baked two dozen cookies last week and threw them in the freezer just in case an incident like this came up. And here's a tray of cheese and crackers. And also, this is a dessert that's been in my family for generations I just whipped up this morning. That's coffee. Those are wonderful homes to go to, by the way. <laughs> Give something worth giving. God does that with us. Giving is revealing about who we are, just like in those hospitality situations. It reveals a lot about who we are. It reveals a lot about what we love. It tells us if we recognize God as giving freedom or restricting freedom. A couple verses here, 27 through 29. It says, And do not neglect the Levites living in your towns, for they have no allotment or inheritance of their own. At the end of every three years, bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store it in your towns, so that the Levites who have no allotment or inheritance of their own, and the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied, and so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the works of your hands. So we'll start at the, the first. Do not neglect the Levites. The Levites were sort of mid-level priests, if you will, the people who were charged with taking care of the tabernacle, the traveling temple, before there was a temple, and all that went around uh, with that, setting it up, taking it down, maintaining it on a day-in and day-out level. They were responsible for tithing as well. They were to tithe to the priests. That's who they gave to. Add to that, then it says, feed the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widows. The Levites had no inheritance among the other 11 tribes. That was by design. People were supposed to take care of them every year. And, you know, if you're having this feast, this tithe, invite a Levite. Bring them over to dinner. They live in, in all your areas, so invite them over. But then the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, some scholars, and I, I don't think they're quite on, but this will just be for shock value, they say that, okay, if you're supposed to collect 10% for the foreigner, the father, and the widow in the third year, and you're supposed to be collecting for the Levites, and then you're also supposed to collect just generally, in some cases, the tithe could be 30% in some years. Well, I don't know that that's exactly the case. Where it's not that clear of a picture. But the point that we get here is be generous with what God has given you to those around you who don't have. And if you read the text carefully, it doesn't just say give them enough so that they have enough to eat. So that they've got a meal a day. It says give them enough to be satisfied. That's what it says. Because that's what God does with us. Give us enough to be satisfied. They have, Now provide them with food. Provide them with the family to eat it with too in those times. Give them both of those things. Recognize God's love and grace on you. By recognize those around you who need that grace as well. Love those whom God loves. That's, I think, the third thing we pick up here. I said I'd qualify tithing a little bit since we're talking about that. And so here are a couple about three questions that sometimes come up, or categories that sometimes come up when we talk about tithing. The first one is, do we need to tithe today? We've been reading out of Deuteronomy. 
Okay, so how do we translate that to our world? Because some people will, if you go and, you know, Google tithing today, you're going to get every possible scenario and perspective out there, right? We don't need to tithe anymore because it's Old Testament. It's under the law. We're under grace. We do need to tithe absolutely 10% exactly to the, to the dime, right, or the penny. And my answer, do we need to tithe today? Yes and no. There's a good answer for you. Uh, I'm going to c- credit Randy Alcorn with saying this, but he said tra- uh, tithing are the training wheels of giving. That's how he says it, and that's really more of my perspective. Because when you look at the Old Testament picture particularly of giving, there are four sort of key texts on tithing. They don't exactly line up the way we'd like them to as far as detail, but they tell us the same basic things. Beyond that, though, you've got the idea of the first fruits and redeeming your firstborn and the tithe and offerings. You have a whole host of things. People were supposed to be generous. That's really the overarching thing. The specifics of that are different depending on where you're looking. And why would we limit ourselves to 10% anyways? Because if we're not careful, we can get legalistic about it. We could easily. Somebody could give 10% exactly and say, I've done my part. Now, God, you do yours. I think it, it much more is reflective of what's going on in us. I'd rather be a person who's giving by nature. Somebody who's checked the box, giving one, two, five, ten percent. So should we tithe today? Depends on what's in your heart in lots of ways. Is it generous or not? I consider ten percent to be the floor, incidentally, not the ceiling. That's why the training wheels come. It's very good. Okay, here's the second question. Can I give you a bag of grain if I'm giving to the church, a side of beef, or a chicken instead of money? Because we're dealing with the Old Testament world, right? And they're not dealing in money, although at one point they're dealing with silver, but then they exchange the silver. So somebody might ask me that. Can I just give you a chicken as my tithe? And I'll say, yes, absolutely. If that is how your direct deposit or uh, check is made at the bank when you deposit your money from uh, your work, if that's how you're paid, if that's how you pay at Walmart or Target or wherever you shop or high V, and you pay in chickens, you can pay us in chickens too. How about that? You're not paying us, obviously. But it's a translation principle is all that's really going on here, right? So in the Old Testament world, they're dealing with wheat and wool. In our world, we're dealing with money and numbers in bank accounts. I don't think it's a hard translation to make. Some people make it a hard translation, but I don't think it's a hard translation. Deuteronomy doesn't say church, though. So some might ask, well, should I give to church? And I say this, not exclusively. It's about being generous people, isn't it? But there are qualifications that we read that I think are significant. Go to verse 23. It's told, you know, after you're told, eat the grain or eat the tithe, all of those things, it says this, do it all in the presence of the Lord your God, where? At the place he will choose as the dwelling for his name. And why? So that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. Seems like those are two helpful qualifications. At the dwelling of God's name and so that you would revere God's name. I'd make the simple argument that the church worldwide is not the totality of the kingdom of God, but that the church is part of where God's name dwells. And we see that in the local congregation, that's the practical way we live that out. So should we give to church? Yes. Should we give to other organizations? Yes. Absolutely. If it honors God's name. If we honor God with that giving. I previous to being here many of you know we lived in Colorado Springs which is the capital of the world for Christian nonprofits and 501c3s and you know what all my 501c3s will tell me if you just give to 501c3s and not to your local congregation we won't exist we rely on the church the local church to exist and do our work so don't give exclusively to the church but don't neglect the church in the process of that And I think there is a pretty easy translation we can make when we look at those qualifications. And somebody might even say something as simple as, and I've heard this sort of sentiment before, God already has my heart. He probably doesn't need my money. He can do whatever he wants, right? And I say that's probably true. So if he already has your heart, you don't need the money. Give it up. No, I don't really say that. But 
I want to qualify this at the end. Some people just aren't making ends meet, and I understand that. And I don't stand before you saying we're a money-hungry church and we want all your money. If you can't make ends meet, there should be grace there. But I will say this, because Stephanie and I have been there too in the past. I think it's better to give something rather than nothing. I really do. Whether it's 50 cents, a dollar, or 20 dollars, I think it says a lot about who we are when we give something even of the smallest variety rather than nothing. It's not insignificant to God because it's not about money, ultimately. Some people don't want to give or don't want to give much, and I say in that case, that's where we really do need to do a gut check and check our heart. And I say it very seriously, idolatry lurks around the corner in those cases. We have to watch out. God is not honored when we withhold. And I'm not simply talking about giving to church. I'm just talking about giving anywhere, being generous at all. I don't think God is honored when we withhold. Obviously, we know that in church budgets, I'm standing here talking, and you know my salary is drawn from a church budget. We do ministry based on a church budget, and I say this. If God wants it to succeed, and this is my experience, it doesn't matter if we withhold or not, it will succeed because God wants it to succeed. It's not about me standing here hoping for a paycheck or anything like that, but looking at this and saying, where is your heart? Where is my heart? in all of this. Whenever we protest in not giving and withholding and we're not generous, it comes at a cost to us personally. And we have to add up that cost. Giving shapes the giver. I believe we should give out of abundance. It's an issue of love. It's not an issue of money at all. That's what you see here. Revere the name. Give something worth giving. Love those whom God loves. Very little of that has to do with money. God owns it. God doesn't need it. God wants us, is what God wants. Let me give us a, a final story here. I recently was reading Tortured for Christ by Richard Wormbrand, the Reverend Richard Wormbrand, who started Voice of the Martyrs. If you haven't read it, remarkable testimony. He was imprisoned for about 14 years in Romania under the communist regime. He wrote the book in the 60s after being released from prison um, where Christians in that time period had been rather brutally tortured and beaten and imprisoned just for being Christians. And he writes this in one page, and I was sort of humbled by this. He says, One great lesson arose from all the beatings, tortures, and butchery of the communists, that the spirit is master of the body. We felt the torture but it often seemed as something distant and far removed from the spirit, which was lost in the glory of Christ and his presence with us. When we were given one slice of bread a week and dirty soup every day, we decided we would faithfully tithe even then. Every tenth week, we took the slice of bread and gave it to a weaker brethren as to the master. I don't say that as shame. I say that as perspective and as a humbling moment. God wants our heart. It's not simply about what we give. It's that we do give. It's that we are generous people. And in any culture, in any part of the world, that's possible. God gives abundantly to us. God loves us. And we show our love by giving back by giving out of abundance what God has given us. Let's pray. Lord, if you have our hearts, craft us into generous people. Grant us that virtue. Let us remove from ourselves the vices of greed or of pride or those things that hold us from having your heart, from loving you, from showing that love to you. God, let us not be consumed simply with the things of this world, but with the things that you love, with the people that you love. Let us spend time with those people and be generous with them, for that is how we show your love to one another. God, we pray this in the name of your Son, who loved us so much. Amen.